Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight to celebrate the launch of The Lost Expert. Um, I'm Alex Snyder from Queen Books, one of the co-owners, and we're, we're happy to be co-hosting this event with the Canadian Jewish News tonight. Um, so the structure is that we're going to have a 30-minute discussion between Hal and Belden, and then they will answer, or Hal will answer questions that you can submit via the um, chat box. Um, and if you would like a signed copy, we will have lots of signed copies at Queen Books, and those can be either picked up in store or if you go to our website, queenbooks.ca, there's an opportunity to email us and we can, we can send them out for delivery as well. Okay. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the sacred land on which Cormorant Books and Queen Books operates. It has been the site of human activity for many thousands of years more than 15,000. This land is a territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was a subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and steward the, the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Caranto remains home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Um, I'm going to send things over to Mark Cote, uh, the publisher of Cormorant Books for over 20 years. Along the way, he has had the unmitigated pleasure of working with authors and poets from across Canada. In the last two decades, Cormorant Books has been nominated for Small Press Publisher of the Year eight times by the Canadian Booksellers Association. It won the award three times. Mark has won the Libris for Editor of the Year twice. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Alex. Wonderful to see you, if only on video, um, and to see everyone else. Um, thank you very much to uh, Queen Books and the Canadian Jewish News for co hosting this event. Um, if we were live and um, and uh, we were standing in this beautiful bookstore, Queen Books on Queen Street East, I would call your attention to the gorgeous books on the shelves and on the tables. And I would tell you this store has brilliant staff and they will be more than happy to help you. Um, the Canadian Jewish News, many people I hope are familiar with, and I encourage everyone attending to check out the Canadian Jewish News website at thecjn.ca. That is thecjn.ca. Um, and now very briefly, I'd like to congratulate Hal Nitzvicki, <clears throat> pardon me, on the publication of The Lost Expert. Um, this is a novel I'm very proud to publish and I'm very, very proud to publish Hal. Um, I've been familiar with Hal and his work for, let us just say a number of years. Um, I think somewhere in my deep archives, I might actually have one of the first copies of one of the two or three first editions of Broken Pencil. Um, this novel uh, means a lot to me uh, because it talks about identity, which is of course one of the subjects that, uh, or one of the things that gets discussed these days, perhaps far too much. Uh, but Hal takes it from a very intellectual point of view and walks away from uh, the current ideas about um, identity and he discusses it uh, in a different way. Uh, it, the book is funny, it is very funny and places and in other places it is deeply touching and it has great resonance which unfortunately um, we need to hear right now um, as it touches on a time when in North America and the United States in particular, anti-Semitism was um, normal and it was dangerous then. And it is again, of course, becoming very dangerous now. Um, I'd like to introduce Felden. Felden Coburn is an assistant professor of social political science and indigenous studies at the University of Ottawa. He's Anishinaabe and a member of the Algonquins of Pikwak Nagan First Nation. Dr. Coburn holds degrees in economics and political science 
and completed his PhD at Queen's University. And Veldon is going to take over from me now. Thank you, Veldon. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's my pleasure, everyone, to be here this evening. Uh, it's an exceptional book, and uh, we'll get into it shortly, but I don't know if he needs a great introduction, but if you don't know Hal, Hal Needs Vecchi is a writer, speaker, cultural commentator, and editor whose work challenges preconceptions and confronts readers with the offenses of everyday life. He is the author of 11 books of fiction and nonfiction, including The Archaeologists, which had been shortlisted for the Mary Score Award for Best Book by a Manitoba publisher. Hal is also the founder and publisher of Broken Pencil, the magazine of zine culture and independent arts. Thanks and congratulations, Hal, on this. Uh, this is a magnificent book. You've passed along. It's a great tome. It's considerable in size, and uh, uh, it'll it. it after reading or writing 11 books, this is a good 450 pager for people to turn through. And uh, it does touch on those themes that Mark had mentioned. And why am I here? Well, we've gotten to know each other in past times. And uh, my interest overlaps in it academically is that you delve into some of the more theoretical and philosophical questions of our times of identity. And I just happen to study that. So what is this Anishinaabe guy doing here, this Indigenous guy and this Jewish white writer have in common? Well, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about that. And um, But first and foremost, congratulations on this momentous release. It's a huge book that, uh, uh, you know, and it's not a cliche to say that everyone's going to enjoy and the subjects are gripping and intellectually with considerable depth. So thanks for joining us tonight. I know it's your night, but... Um, I wanted to open up with something not for you to answer immediately because we'll close out on it before we going, but there's, there's something to the book that uh, I think everyone will recognize themselves in it in the sort of twists and pitfalls and serendipitous manners in which we move through life is that the lead character in this Chris, there's, he takes on an identity, which is a deceit, uh, a sort of a con it's, serendipitous it's accidental but what scratches at his consciousness all the time is what happens when everyone finds out what is going to transpire then we don't have to answer that now but i want to ask you about this the origins of it how did you first conceive this idea is it lays out sort of uh you know because it is a twisting plot that we can't give away too much today but it's uh something that dawns on you that I think is something of our time. Yeah, thanks Veldon, and, and thanks for being here and thanks to everyone for being here. So the book is, you know, for, at its core, it's, it's about deceit uh, and, and identity shifting, but, it, but it's also about the beauty of those things, the possibility of those things. And the, there's this one, all my books I should say are uh, they start with a feeling, an emotion. So I, I don't really, you know, I never develop a, a, a whole a plot out of uh, uh, what if this happened or what if that happened. I develop it out of a feeling that I have experienced, and then I try to try to capture that feeling in 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 prose. Uh, so the feeling that came over me was one day about maybe probably maybe, let's say eight years ago. Uh, I was walking along uh, Argyle Street, uh, heading toward Ossington. So I'm in my neighborhood, and this is the path that I take to drop the kids to school every day. Uh, and I'm walking along, and all of a sudden, uh, I stop at the corner of Argyle and Ossington, and I look at the bakery, uh, and the Portuguese bakery overnight has become a Jewish bakery. Uh, as a sort of glistening mountain of, of challahs in the uh, in the in the window and it's got all these bagels and, and it's called like mozzies or something uh, and I and I just stood there completely confounded you know because you sort of see something that that makes no sense and yet somehow makes perfect sense uh, and I had this sort of sudden feeling of of uh of, of wistful happiness. Now, this would be 
I'm like, how great that, that the Portuguese bakery is now a Jewish bakery, at least for me. You know? <laughs> and then suddenly uh, the feeling evaporated and I looked around and I, and I realized, oh, this isn't a, you know, this isn't really happening. This is a, a movie, uh, a movie set. And they've taken over the Portuguese <laughs> bakery and turned it into a Jewish bakery. And it's kind of fake. Uh, but in those few minutes that I was just sort of standing there perplexed, it felt so real. Um, and then there was this sort of rush of feeling like a, I almost felt like I was going to cry or something. Uh, not because it, you know, because I, I wasn't getting the good access to bagels that I had hoped for. <laughs> uh, I don't have to drive to Harvard Bakery, uh, but because it just seemed so real and then so not real. And I was left in that space between the real and the not real, the possibilities. Uh, and I felt sort of betrayed and yet also glad that this this hadn't happened because that would that would be a very strange thing to happen to a Portuguese neighborhood <laughs> to suddenly have a Jewish bakery. Uh, and so that was the feeling. That was the feeling that I was trying to capture with all, all of the things that Chris goes through. And it wasn't um, it wasn't a, a easy feeling to capture, you know, because it's it's displacement, it's 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 joy, it's despair all at once. Uh, and and you know, I entered into a very complex project based on on really just wow, that was a weird thing that happened. So let's back up a little bit. We haven't said too much about, uh, you know, the larger arcs and the plots that go through here. You wrap up quite a few in, in more complex and sophisticated ways that I, I have no background in, in literature, arts and whatnot. So um, I stand back in awe of the ability that someone can write it. But so what happens is there's an individual just uh, walking through life one day, strolling home through a park. And he wanders, happens to wander through a set, just as you're talking about, like a, um, a movie filming. And this is common in Toronto. I remember doing that when I was living in Toronto 20 years ago. I was an extra in uh, John Q. Public with uh, Denzel Washington. It was in November, but it was supposed to be set in Chicago, I believe it was. But uh, just walking home from the grocery store. This is what happens to Chris in the, in the movie. But the director, and he's sort of a lookalike for a lead in the movie named Thompson, Thompson Holmes, who's sort of gone AWOL, he's disappeared, somebody, and this kind of goes towards one of the many themes that you, you tackle is celebrity. So somebody walks into it, they have that surreal feeling, they've stepped into a different world, unlike Chris, where you get to sort of, well, you get to walk out, Chris sort of runs with it for a little while so he uh, sort of embraces it reluctantly but he gets kind of sucked into it so you know there's a whole host of moods that get to us because when i opened up today and we'll talk a little bit the you know the tensions within individuals the psychic agony of what happens if people find out because he does go with it so your experience there had a few sort of serendipitous, spontaneous, emotive reactions. Here we go and travel through it with Chris and then some other characters walk into the scenes and they throw wrenches into his life. So tell us about those moods and those themes and you know, you know, how does Chris materialize this ghost set within a city? Mm -hmm. Well, I should say that, that I almost went into that bakery to buy a challah. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I didn't because I would have been very, you know, I probably would have been accosted by security. Uh, and security shows up uh, several times in the book uh, as they sort of are, are around this movie set eyeing uh eyeing the trailers and all the all the equipment and everything. And Chris is sort of like, uh, why doesn't security stop me? Why, you know, and and what what how could this be? Why aren't, why aren't the uh, powers that control these sorts of things sorting all of this out? Uh, and that's a big uh, realization for Chris, where he realizes that the powers that be uh, don't really 
sort out reality <laughs> you know that the individual has to kind of make that decision uh in terms of what what is going to be real for them uh and uh, and the force of will creates a lot of things you know, puts a lot of things into the world uh where an individual just somehow has that force of will and decides this is what's real uh and so chris has this this sort of uh experience where at first, everyone insists that he is the celebrity action movie star Thompson Holmes uh, playing this kind of puny uh, kind of underdeveloped. So Thompson Holmes is, is supposed to be losing muscle you know, and be skinny and kind of ragged looking for this movie, which is very different from his usual roles uh, as an action hero. Um, and so they 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 leap on Chris as this kind of skinny, underdeveloped Thompson Holmes, uh, and he he says, "Well, this will be fun, you know. <laughs> uh, this is weird. Okay, I'll go with it." And then all of a sudden, he's ushered to the set, and the director of the movie, Brian Reed, is yelling, "Action! Let's go!" <laughs> uh, and it's it's an incredible, you know, it's fun. It's a fun thing to imagine. Right. What would happen if if that happened to you? What would you do? And of course, he goes with it. He tries to get out of it. Uh, and then you get into the psychology of 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 the characters. And to me, that that's, you know, the really exciting stuff is is depending on who you were, you would take it in different directions. You know, if you if you like Veldman has four kids and, a, and a, you know, and is a professor in Ottawa, uh, you're probably not going to stick around that long. <laughs> uh, if you're Chris and you don't have that much going on in your life and you're sort of a 20 something uh, college dropout working as a waiter uh, and your parents are very distant from you and you just feel sort of disconnected from life, uh, this could be something you go with. And that's what he does. Yeah, so there is something alluring about it. So he adopts uh, sort of willingly, but with the outside sort of pressures of like, well, look where I found myself. The The lead character sort of disappears from the face of the planet, sort of. He's on the run, you know, just wants to walk away from his life. So he happens to be here and gets mistaken, case of mistaken identity, but he adopts it, he embraces it. There's an allure to the, the Hollywood hero, Thompson Holmes, but everyday Joe, Chris being, you know, just I'm a waiter, I was walking home one day and I passed through these sets that, well, if you're going through Toronto or other uh, locales in Canada or across North America, you can stumble into these oftentimes, but, you know, there is that um, allure for him. Uh, he does take a look at celebrity from his point of view and says, well, let's see what I can do with this. So, yeah. So for, for me, for, you know, we could look at and say, well, what do you suppose would it take to turn down the opportunity at celebrity? We, it's, it's a fantasy that some people might toy with in the back of their mind because we're, were put up, uh, and this is a big theme in your book, is the clash of public image versus reality. So you're talking about this microcosm and also what's produced for us to consume of uh, what we suppose is reality. So allure and, you know, what what could it be for for Chris? Um, and, and he gets into a little bit of trouble when he, he, he realizes very quickly what celebrity entails. Well, I think that's the, you know, that's the one of the great, uh themes of the 20th century the 20th century the 21st century uh is what is celebrity and you know what it, what is humanity in the context of celebrity and so those two things generally don't really square very well because you know celebrity is sort of a commodification of of an individual creating this multiple uh many manifold many headed product you know you're the celebrity and you could be on a t-shirt you could be on a video you could be in a movie you know you could be in 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 a courtroom uh you could be on the news all can be everything is for sale right it's a fantastic thing for the for that sort of corporate world to capitalize on this idea of celebrity but 
at, if you're actually that person, uh, you know, uh, this is it becomes a very difficult thing to navigate, especially as celebrity evolves uh, through the 19th century into the 20th century and and people can become more interested in the prurient background uh, information about your life, which is, you know, a deliberate uh, development that that a process that that Hollywood went through and said, you know what, like it's not the movie that we're selling, it's the stars. Mm -hmm. And so once they decided that, you started to have a lot of these gossip magazines and information about the the celebrity lives. And so Chris, uh, you know, isn't just adopting the 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 action star Thompson Holmes is outward movie star life, which is awesome. <laughs> you know, he's also developing his, uh, uh, he has to adopt Thompson Holmes's interior life, which is less than awesome. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to give out too many spoilers, but Thompson Holmes is not uh, a great dude. Uh, <laughs> as we sort of suspect, I think that a lot of movie stars uh, are probably not that great uh, in, in their, uh, in how they conduct themselves. <laughs> Uh, in particular, Thompson Holmes is not that great around women, uh, and Chris has to kind of face the the consequences of that, and and it becomes a very um, becomes very painful for him because you're sort of saying, well, I didn't do that, uh, but but you did if that's your identity, if that's who you're going to adopt, and you know, celebrity is in my mind, a, a, a real cancer in society. It's, it's probably one of the worst ideas uh, that, that industrial society ever invented, the idea that there would, we'd sort of select random people, uh, not necessarily based on talent or skill, and we would uh, elevate them as our sort of demigods, uh, and they would be everywhere. Um, and so Chris has this like inside position of not being a celebrity, but being a celebrity, and it's and and it's an exciting place to be. As for me, as the writer, it's exciting to have a character who's in that because I can sort of be like, let's throw this at him and see what he does. Yeah. So you know, unfortunately, Thompson Holmes, the great uh, Hollywood hero of the time, he sort of goes or tries to go underground or what have you. There's, I can't point to any. Um, direct examples off the top of my mind of Hollywood celebrities or international celebrities at the moment that just sort of say, you know what, I'm going to give up the game. It's been great, but uh, they're running away from scandal. So that's what Thompson Holmes is doing. And Chris kind of quickly finds out that um, you get the good, but you also have to take the bad. And, uh, you know, as trying to be not just the doppelganger for that one particular incident where he's going to, you know, walk onto the set, but he also tries to get away with uh, conning into everyone that I am Thompson Holmes and uh, then finds out that he's now a, a commodity too. So you touched on that a little bit and he sort of gets a sense that, well, he's transversing the, you know, always straddling the divide between real and imaginary of the superficial and authentic when you know it raises big questions for him to struggle with as how do we know people and relationships are authentic especially in that sort of commercialized production and and seeped and you know in the stew of the worst excesses of celebrity yeah and sort of chris is looking for uh parental figures He's a bit lost in that regard, as so many of us are. Not me, mom, not me. Uh, <laughs> and he, uh, you know, he latches onto the director of the movie, Bryant Reed, uh, and they develop this, this real, uh, this relationship uh, I have with Bryant as kind of a father figure advising him and constantly sort of saying, well, you know, the like before we started the movie you were totally different you know i thought you were just an asshole <laughs> and and uh you know he's always asking him oh do you still have that uh you know that 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 delorean you bought from uh, michael j fox and stuff <laughs> and chris is saying what i don't know what are you talking about you know he doesn't remember of course uh that he owns the back to the future delorean <laughs> uh, and but he's looking for this father and he's kind of 
you know, and he and he develops this uh, this relationship, and 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 for him, it's very real. But there's also this sort of question of, well, is this is this a real relationship for Brian Reed, or is he just sort of working his actor, you know? And Brian Reed is, uh, you know, again, we don't want to give away too much, but Brian Reed is a he's a, a very successful Jewish. Uh, uh, filmmaker at the end of his career, and he's never delved into Jewish themes or anything. Um, and so he he's trying to make one last great movie. And he's told the um, he's <laughs> he's told the the Hollywood bigwigs that it's going to be a cerebral action movie with Thompson Holmes, and the, and the Thompson Holmes will get you know kind of Academy Award cred where he usually gets dismissed, you know, and that this movie will. Uh, will prepare, propel him and Thompson Holmes into a new kind of world. And, and Thompson Holmes is going to star as the lost expert, a sort of plaintive, uh, cerebral action hero who finds lost people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see all the, all the balls are up in the air now as a writer. And, you know, it's, it's not something that I set out to do uh overtly because i don't i don't really you know i'm not a sort of i'm not that smart uh it's more something that happens and almost organically and then i say oh okay chris is lost the lost expert is lost thompson holmes is lost bryant reed is lost uh where does this you know they're all lost and and this is fantastic for me um, as a writer, because I think loss uh, and being lost are are really quintessential themes of the 21st century. Speaking of which, in all this, there's a little bit of a backstory behind here that takes on a life of its own. That's you know I can't explain it again. I have no background in the literature arts or anything. Is you know it strikes me as sort of masterful. But when we've talked about this, that you got sort of sidetracked because you had to develop a parallel story that went through the background you said it when we were talking about it one time is it took you almost a year to figure that out because and I don't know if everyone knows this is uh you know the the culmination of four years maybe of of work yeah more like more like six but six. Yeah. okay yeah the idea dawns on you eight years ago working this out um, but there is a screenplay because this is, yeah, you know, he walks into the set and then there are the, uh, all the sort of usual figures, the, uh, authorities that are on set. And then I guess working through the filming of the movie develops these relationships. So you actually had to, uh, write, a, sort of a separate screenplay to play in the background, to weave into the plot of, you know, the screenplay of the lost expert in order for like, you're writing two stories. And they have to coexist holistically in order for this entire book to work. And through that, it's through the, the sort of parallel screenplay of the lost expert that these characters take their shape and you're molded them. And, you know, how, how does Chris and say Brian get depth out of this? So you've, you've alluded to a little bit that they strike up a friendship and they see something on the surface of one another, but there's more to it. Yeah, I think that as Chris settles into his role as the lost expert in the actual movie, Bryant is starts to be drawn to him as, well, this guy, he gets it. He gets me. Uh, of course, Chris doesn't get him at all, <laughs> or maybe he does. So it's this incredible tension of, of kind of, you know, people be people passing each other in the night in a way. Uh, and but they but they do get some aspects of each other because they both feel sort of dispossessed uh, by by life. Uh, you know, they're floating. They they feel they're 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 just in 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 the clouds, floating on their own in a bubble. Um, you know, so the, so this movie that Brian Reed ultimately uh, is is directing and and wrote. Uh, is is set in a kind of parallel 1930s um, America that I ripped off from um, uh, Philip Roth. Uh, he, you know, he, he won't mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's basically the idea that that America in the 1930s turns to fascism instead of turns to 
uh, you know, turns to fighting Hitler in World War II. Um, and so there's this sort of shadowy figure who's running for president uh, and the lost expert is being manipulated by this figure but doesn't realize it. Uh, and the last expert is trying to discover his powers and who he really is. Uh, and so there's all this, all these, these machinations behind in the background. And meanwhile, the Jews are being herded into the ghetto and, and it's ratcheting up in that respect. Um, and so there's this, you know, the, the running joke in the book in a way is that um, Chris doesn't really know how to act and he doesn't, there's no script. He never finds a script or is given a script. Uh, so he says as little as possible. Uh, and kind of in all the scenes, he's incredibly sort of quiet and stoic. And Brian Reed loves this and, and, and says that, you know, he's, he's, it's amazing what he's, what he's able to do and how he's able to interpret this character and enter into this script. Uh, and, you know, as a, as a writer, it was it was so frustrating because I I had this idea, and then I said, okay, well let's give give the reader a little taste of what this movie is about, and then I started to think, well who is Brian Reed and what does he want and and then I was like, well he wants this great movie and then how is Chris responding to this movie and then I was like, oh my god, I'm writing a movie, uh, you know, <laughs> and and so I kind of stopped writing the book. And took maybe it was a year. I mean, it might have been eight months. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and I wrote the screenplay to the Lost Expert, uh, much of which ended up in the book as a kind of faux screenplay. So it's not entirely a screenplay. Uh, hopefully, it's not sort of unreadable uh, as screenplays can be. Um, but it it appears in screenplay form, and Chris sort of. You see Chris and he's being led to the set and Bryant is, is whispering in his ear and he's saying, okay, you know, in this scene, the lost expert is hungry and he's lost and he has to do this and that. And, you know, and then he kind of gives Chris a push and says, you know, don't fuck it up, Holmes. You know? <laughs> and, and, then that, and then there's a sort of a page break and bam, you're in the movie. Um, so it was incredibly fun. And, but also incredibly stupid and time consuming. Uh, <laughs> you know, people who write film scripts, uh, they, they do pretty well for themselves, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, should, I should get into that business. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it gives us some insight and it goes back to that clash of public image versus reality. And, you know, talking about this is what is Hollywood and celebrity? Perhaps it's the sort of center of the uh, universe for the cesspool of humanity inauthentic superficiality you know you talk about chris having a temptation towards you know indulging himself with you know the gorgeous actresses like hollywood lifestyle um but you know part of it is him being lost himself uh and going to hollywood is like this sort of you know analog for an empty place a place for estranged people they're estranged from their past to go to so brian turns out to be sort of an empty and hollow individual maybe clinging on to you know the last remnants of his career or hoping for you know a little bit of breath to be breathed into or some life be breathed into it um it's a little bit about how close we can get to or how far we can go before we can get back home mm. you know? well home yeah home is a great you know, it's a great kind of uh, absence in the book. Uh, Chris has no home or feels like he has no home. Brian Reed feels like he has no home. Uh, and these characters sort of circle around looking for what is what is home? What is the past? What is my heritage, my destiny? Uh, and, it, you know, to me, it's it's it, it's there's a lot of people like that uh, in the in in our in our kind of soulless, homeless world where you can fly across the world and then, you know, you get in, a, in an Uber in another country and, and get, you know, say, take me to the Starbucks, <laughs> you know, uh, in that context, what is home? Uh, you know, Thompson Holmes, worldwide action star, as big in China as he is in, in New Jersey. Uh, what is home in that context? You know, there's this feeling that 
they're they're both looking for something to ground them some meaning and you know Bryant Reed has come through he's he's gotten Oscars he's revered for the movies he made I don't know let's say in the 80s you know <laughs> um, but he's come out the other end and said you know I've never made a movie about my Jewish identity. I've never made a movie about who I am as a person, about my family. You know, there's this there's this line. If anyone looked, saw the uh, excerpt in in the Canadian Jewish News, they they're sort of wandering in the in the woods with the film crew, and and Reed's Reed says, uh, you know, he turns to to Chris and says, you know, most of my family died in a forest like this, and. Chris has no idea what he's talking about, right? He says, uh, my grandparents, the children, the goats, the town, the cats, all of them dragged out into the woods and shot dead. Uh, you know, and then, then he, Chris sort of looks at him, has no idea what he's talking about. And Reed says, well, maybe not the goat, you know, <laughs> maybe they left the goat. Uh, and so, so, you know, Brian Reed is, is trying to, uh reconcile himself with the fact that he was that he's he's lost his roots uh he can never get them back they were taken from him um and chris uh feels like he has no roots his parents are divorced his mother is is a depressive uh his father is 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 you know one of those people who sips white wine with ice cubes and listens to the you know classical music on the CBC, uh, you know, <laughs> and is sort of uh, don't bother me, you know, I'm drinking my my white wine on ice. Uh, so it's 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 a very interesting thing because, you know, we are both from cultures that have experienced a tremendous amount of loss. Uh, and and destruction of our of our heritage, um, and in some ways, you know that's that's an incredible burden to bear. Uh, but in other ways, uh, you know, you can see it as a, as a great gift that we have cultures, you know, <laughs> we have backgrounds. Uh, we can turn to those those cultures, however shattered and 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 destroyed they were uh, and say, you know, we're gonna pick up the pieces and, and take some of the best of that and, 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 and try, to, try to, to weave a new tapestry um, for our children and, and for the future. Um, and, and if you have someone like Chris who just doesn't, doesn't have anything, you know, uh, to me that, that I don't know which is worse. So it's kind of posits that question of, of you know, what if you don't have a culture at all? You know, what if you have nothing? Uh, or Brian Reed, haunted by what he kind of wishes he he had, or wishes he, or or, or you know, has lost. So, well, you start laying all this out, and I'm thinking in the back of my mind um, about you personally as a writer now. That um, maybe there's a more painful question here. Is uh, not but painful in that sense is that. Well, has Hal been lost? This is his 11th book, and this might be the first time in an article you wrote, just sort of reflecting on this, um, that there is a Jewish aspect of the book for you as a writer is, is, you know, we find ourselves too running as far as way as we can from who we are. And this one, you, this may be the first time you've gone back to who you are as a, a, a being Jewish. And embracing that and, and using that for this and it hasn't appeared before I guess in the previous 10 books that um that it was particularly special for this book for you hmm. could you tell us and you know maybe reflect on that for us if it's not too much <laughs> yeah. you know I mean I wrote in the in the article you're referring to about about my family and 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 you know they were Polish peasants in the shtetl, and and they, they you know for the most part they didn't make it. Uh, they were part of the six million, um, and it it's something that obviously haunts you. You know I could have had uh, who knows how many relatives you know <laughs> a living who knows where you know, uh, and that could have been that could have been incredibly beautiful. And who knows what that shtetl culture would have evolved into in different circumstances. Um, but at the same time, it's something that 
you know, like you said so so perfectly, like you you run away from that, you know, <laughs> you don't want to be as a young writer identified with that necessarily. You don't want someone to come up and say, oh, well, you know, you're you're an indigenous writer. That's what you do. You know, mm-hmm. you can only write about the sad stuff of, you know, <laughs> about what happened to the indigenous people. Uh, same with the Jews, you know, I don't, I, I didn't want to necessarily be that. I didn't feel that, uh, you know, part of that, I think is the sort of when, you know, when my parents sent me to, to Jewish school, uh, I did, a, I just did everything I could to get kicked out. You know, you know <laughs> like, please get rid of me, <laughs> get me out of here. Uh, and, you know, and now as I get older, and I, uh, of course, I'm still very young and, and uh, young. <laughs> um, you know, you see, you start to reconsider some of those positions, obviously, and, and other things start to come into your writing. Uh, and I think that this is the first book that I have sort of both howls in it. You have the Chris Howl, who is like the feckless kind of, I don't know what's, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Why should I even do anything? It's all so stupid, you know? You have that guy. Uh, and then you have Bryant Reed, who, who has accomplished a lot in his life, but also still feels sort of the emptiness, uh, possibly uh, because of that, that rupture in history, in his personal history and in, and in the history of the world uh that that you know world war ii and the holocaust represents so i think it's it's a um it's an evolution for me as a writer to kind of you know all the other books were about that guy who just you know is gonna float around have no meaning uh and then you know random shit happens and you know you you try to uh you're, you're trying to find that that world uh which so many people are part of um this book has has an extra dimension in it of that that jewish heritage um and it's not you know it's definitely not like a conventional book uh about about any kind of you know we see a lot of these now where you have a i think you call them sort of a trauma memoir at one point Mm -hmm. You know, very <laughs> popular genre. This yeah. is not that at all, uh, and it, and it takes some poke, takes some some pretty hard uh, uh, pokes at that kind of idea. Uh, and but it, it but it, it's that yearning. You know, at the end, it's the yearning for meaning that I think everyone can identify with, whether or not your your particular tribe of people has been through. Uh, a horrific erasure or not yeah um that's profound enough to leave it there to go to um some questions from the crowd but we didn't get to talk about it but maybe it'll be more tantalizing for people to buy the book so that they can work it out when you ask yourself you know what happens when everyone finds out that there's you know one lie that might be or one sort of misrepresentation that's taken on a life of its own um you know what gnaws at you or what you know just bites the nails of of the anxiety in our mind what happens when everyone finds out and maybe we'll leave that for everyone to buy the book and find out what chris struggles with this is that, yeah all, all, a, I'm gonna, all i'm gonna say about that is that when Chris is finally uh, exposed as a fraud, uh, it is nothing at all like what he thinks it's going to be. <laughs> so yeah, nail, uh, you know, cliffhanger there. Let's, uh, you know, let's leave it at that and, and hopefully people will buy the book and find out, you know, what Yeah, happened. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, we have some questions from, every, from several people attending. So it was Susan Hughes. Uh, so she's, I'm listening to Hal describe the main characters, Brian and Chris, both of whom are men. I'm wondering if there are any other central figures or minor characters who are women or other genders in this novel. And if Hal could discuss why there are or aren't. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. So there's, uh, there's a, well, there's not that many other characters actually in this book, uh, but 
there there is two very important um, people in this book that that are are women. Uh, there is Chris's original girlfriend Lori, uh, who he kind of basically just abandons, uh, and he abandons her almost you know for this kind of life in the uh, uh, it, you know for this Hollywood life. And then Chris falls in love with his uh, assistant on the set, Allison. And he has this, you know, he sort of almost becomes, I don't want to say obsessed, but, uh, you know, he's, he's very much besmitten. Is that a word, Belton? Besmitten? Uh, smitten? Maybe it's just smitten. Just smitten, maybe. <laughs> Mark yeah. is shaking his head. <laughs> uh, he's smitten by her. And, and she is, of course, uh, she's heard the rumors about what Thompson Holmes is like, and she doesn't want to get involved in that. Uh, so there's this very fraught, tense relationship that they have, uh, which I think is, is central to the book um, because, you know, there has to be people who are responding to Chris as Thompson Holmes and showing him that it's not all going to be just, you know, Oh, can I, can I give you the keys to my sports car, Mr. Holmes, <laughs> you know, uh, that the baggage is also limiting in some ways. Um, and then the third uh, in, super important female character is Chris's co-star, Michelle, uh, who uh, is, is this, you know, sort of famous actress in her own right, uh, who has a relationship a very negative relationship in the past with Thompson Holmes. Um, and so that becomes something that also takes up uh, a lot of energy in the, in the novel. And, the, and there's this, uh, uh, one of my favorite scenes in the whole novel is, is when his co-star comes uh, to Chris and, and decides, okay, you know, Thompson Holmes has changed. He's not, he's not as, as big an asshole as he used to be. <laughs> Uh, and she she tries to recruit him for her own movie project, uh, which you know is is incredibly is incredibly uh, telling of 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 what that world is, what the world of celebrity is. Um, so there you know there are there are no uh, other main characters really other than Chris. Uh, and and you know Brian Reed is kind of the next next biggest main character, but these these female characters all have have their own agency and their own world uh, that they live in, and they are sort of uh, far less in awe of Thompson Holmes <laughs> than uh, Chris would like. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Um... Yeah, there is something that, you know, goes on in, in this is that uh, there's a, a life for Chris that's just out of reach. He does have access or, well, he doesn't have access, but there's the assumption that um, um, that he has like a large bank account or something. But of course, he's not, it's not his true identity. So he can't just go to the bank and, and get it. And, you know, he's also um, the relationships as well especially with the women in the world but um there's a lot of other questions that are coming in how so i don't think i'm going to dwell on my my editorial here um yeah. sorry um i think uh i i just lost the other question i think it was from emily that came out of the q a um so maybe i'll go quickly to timothy have you thought about writing a fiction book based off the Peep Diaries, like the novel 1984? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Uh, the Peep Diaries was a nonfiction book I wrote, uh, how we are learning to love watching ourselves and our neighbors. Um, and I think that all my fiction is heavily infused with the ideas of my nonfiction. Uh, particularly yeah around celebrity and uh in the the kind of normal individual who wants to experience celebrity and then and then finds out that it's not what they hoped it would be you know uh so in a way you know i think that this book is it has components of that um it's it's you know, I don't know what will happen in the future, but I'm always toying with different plots and, and ideas that, 
you know, so-and-so reveals these aspects of their life online and it goes bad in these ways or becomes commoditized in these ways. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's such a tangled web and it's all interconnected, our, our perverse desires to become commodities, uh, the idea that we can use our lives as, as celebrity entertainment, you know, <laughs> uh it's all it's all connected and it and i think it definitely appears more in this book than anything else i've written uh before well, thanks samuel asks what do you imagine drives chris's fear of being found out not to be who he is mistaken to be would it really be so bad to be regular chris and not a hollywood star mm. yeah i mean that's the that's the big kind of character development in the novel, which is who is Chris and why, why does he want to be a Hollywood star? And uh, would it be so bad to be Chris? And he's constantly battling with himself on this saying, you know what, uh, you know, it's better to be Chris. This is too much pressure. Uh, no, it's better to be Thompson Holmes. Look at all these people who are loving me and, you know, and Brian Reed keeps telling me I'm, I'm going to win an Oscar, you know? <laughs> so it, the book is not as uh, surface as that. We get to, to find out about Chris's life in the past. And, and as that goes on, we sort of like learn that, uh, we learn more about what Chris is yearning for and what he wants. And you, I think that hopefully the reader will come to sort of forgive Chris for his trespass and start to feel that, okay, he's, you know, he's, a, he's kind of a messed up guy for, for a bunch of, of pretty valid reasons. And let's, you know, let's, let's go with him on this journey uh, rather than let's hate him for what, for, for just, you know, pretending to be someone else and adopting this world. Yeah, you know, we didn't quite get into it um only talked about a few things the good and the bad the warts and all sort of life that he ends up getting despite this nice pristine hollywood polished image that you might get which is spoon fed to us as commodities is we didn't get to mention little scarface oh. and, and and who this character is yeah. so why don't you talk because you know that would turn us off a little bit because he didn't know what he was getting into um the glamour and the glitz of celebrity um has has a, a, a really ugly underbelly. It does, and you know, little Scarface uh, comes along and starts to blackmail Chris, <laughs> and starts to sort of suggest, well, you know, I have the goods on you. Uh, I'm going to ruin your your career, uh, and and so on and so forth. I'm going to do these things to you. Um, so you better. Uh, get your get you know you you better fulfill the agreement that we had agreed on and you know i don't want to again i don't want to ruin too much of the the plot but it's sort of like chris is like what what agreement what am i what's going on here uh and little scarface as well this is what you agreed to do uh you're not doing it you're shooting another movie that's not what we you know uh and and but at the same time it becomes this this uh, character who is also, as we as we learn, like what is you know, is a little Scarface even for real? Like, is this guy for real? Like, what is he? What is he doing in this? You know, and I think it's just a great character uh, and a great foil for Chris as we get into this whole like world of like, what the hell? Uh, who are all these people and what do they want from me, you know, and Chris, Chris has to deal with that. Uh, so, you know, little Scarface is, is kind of, to me, he's the, he's the, he's the funniest character. <laughs> you know, he keeps showing up and trying to blackmail Chris and keeps saying, and Chris keeps saying, I don't know. I don't know who you are. What do you want? You know, I love that. Christina wants to ask, um, do you think there's something, and it's, you know, I guess something like a, something out there that you might understand to be Holocaust fatigue, mm. so maybe, maybe a phenomenon showing up too much in, uh, in writing and storytelling. And I think that's true. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's something that is, is, uh, pervasive in our culture. 
and used in many different ways. And, you know, <laughs> every second day, someone is saying, it's like the Holocaust, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, 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 you know, I have to get a vaccine. It's like the Nazis, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I think that adds to it as well as the more serious side of it's, it's, it's a story that can be overtold in its familiarity in some ways. Uh, so, you know, the, this book does not, is not a, a, a Holocaust story at all. Uh, it's a, and I think we need to find a different ways to talk about the events of the Holocaust in World War II and and even, you know, uh, that, that, that I think applies to other great tragedies of, of the modern era. Um, because you, 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 you can't forget them, but you also can't expect to, you know, retell and retell and, you know, and kind of have people say, oh, okay, you know, it's, I'm still riveted. Uh, you know, is it a fatigue? It's hard, to, it's hard to say. At the end of the day, I'm dedicated not so much to talking about the Holocaust, but talking about rupture. Uh, and what happens when, you're, when your culture is, is severed, you know, abruptly. And, and, and that's an experience that I think is very universal that I think we have. Uh, it's, a, it's a modern, it's a it's an it's an unfortunate uh, consequence of the development of the modern world, um, and it's and to me it's one of the central questions of of our time. Thanks for that, Hal. We'll take one last question, and we'll have to wrap it up really close. Uh, like we're getting close to seven, so from Diane asked, "What was your biggest high and also low in the writing process?" Hmm. Ah, interesting. <laughs> so much happened in the writing of this book. It's almost, you know, it could be another book about the writing of this book, you know, got to get my, um, my, uh, the making of the, the making of the failed dune, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, it's a, that's a really tough question because it was over such a long period. Uh, I think the biggest kind of high you get is when things when you feel like okay I'm not completely in the weeds you know and you're like I can sort of see how this is coming together and then and, and there was a few moments but they're not moments like oh here's the bakery and now it's a Jewish bakery you know <laughs> there are moments alone in a coffee shop um where I'm like yeah that was good writing, you know, <laughs> this will really kind of bridge some of the problems and, uh, and it's writer stuff, you know, it's boring, writing is boring, right, you just sit there and you write and, and you know, uh, you know, and the lows are, again, you know, there's the exterior world, which can, can deliver you some interesting blows, and I've had a lot of those over, over the six years, um, but as a as an from a from the pure context of the the writerly craft, uh, you know, you go back and and you're like, what, who is this? You know, what is this doing here? <laughs> like, so much rewriting and reworking, and 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 that realization that that I needed to develop an entire movie. You know, that that hurt me. <laughs> I love doing it in the end, but it kind of hurt me. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks for all this, uh, Hal. I want to congratulate you once again. I want to encourage everyone to uh, go and purchase the book through Queen's Book. Um, I think there will be uh, uh, more to say about this from Alex uh, in a moment. Did you want to say anything before we close out, Hal? Yeah, I, th I just want to, you know, say a few thank yous uh, and introduce a special guest. Uh, so here's my here's my special guest here. Uh, Hi, I'm Noah. <laughs> Noah, what do you have to tell uh, everybody? Uh, 
buy my Abba's book. Very nice. Very <laughs> nice. <laughs> buy Abba's book. All right, get out of here. Uh, <laughs> There you go. Uh, special guest. She was bugging me. Am I going to get to come on? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do want to. I, I do want to uh, thank some people before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, everyone who who has come out and watched this, uh, you know, it it's just been such a a time over the last six years or so working on this book. All the things that have happened uh, to have everyone here with me is just really. It's, it's very, it's very moving to me. And, you know, I thank you. I really do. Uh, one of the things that happened to me was I got to meet uh, my friend and colleague, Veldon Coburn here. Uh, and so, you know, you never know when the good is going to come out of the bad. And Veldon, I really want to thank you for taking the time. I know you're, you're busy with your four kids uh, in the middle of the semester. Uh, <laughs> But you took the time for this, and you also took the time to extend your friendship to me when I was going through some, uh, we'll say some interesting times. Can we say that? Uh, <laughs> so thank you for being here. Um, and, you know, tonight I'm sipping away at this bottle of Irish whiskey that dad brought over during those interesting times. I don't know if you can see this, but it's your writer's tears, Irish whiskey, uh, <laughs> which I... Uh, I bring up uh, only to say that right up through the writing of this book and right up to today's launch, you know, my parents are my biggest supporters and, and we were pushing to get 200 uh, people to sign up uh, to the launch. Probably 199 of them are my mother's friends. Um, <laughs> love you guys. <laughs> uh, and uh, if you haven't met Nina, you, you will, you will, you know. <laughs> uh, and my family, you know, is is really the great the great strength that keeps me going. Especially my amazing wife, uh, Rachel Greenbaum. Uh, you know, I have to thank her whenever I get the chance. Not only because I don't want to get into trouble, uh, <laughs> but also uh, because she's she's you know she's the one who keeps me going and and says you know stop stop whining and being self pitying and go finish your book. Uh, and she she does that stuff and she's just amazing and you know if you can imagine putting up with me not just for the last six years but for you know a solid 20 or so uh probably more uh so thank you Rachel and of course the kids you saw Noah there's Ellie she's not going to be making an appearance she's 16 uh and they they're you know they're hilarious they make me laugh and they're the ones that I really kind of write for now that I imagine reading the work as they grow up. Uh, and I love you guys. Uh, and then not to drag out the whole thank you thing, but then there's, you know, my writing and publishing family, which is a, which is a, a much close, more close knit family to me now than ever. Uh, Mark Weisblatt at the Canadian Jewish News, who just was like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's sponsor the book. I'd love that. Uh, so go check out their site and, and, you know, they've really kind of relaunched this brand in an important way. So check out what they're doing. Queen Books, uh, Alex, I'm going to, I'm going to come out to the bookstore soon and, and do some hard Hanukkah shopping. Uh, and I encourage everyone to, to go and, and, and hit the Queen Books for their Hanukkah and Christmas needs. Uh, and last but not least, all the people who kind of really helped me shape this book uh emily schultz uh who's a great writer and editor she gave me some really good notes and direction sam hyatt and his people at the rights factory sam's my my agent um which as far as i i can tell involves him every once in a while buying me some pizza uh <laughs> and yelling at me to get my shit together you know uh that's pretty much what i need uh but they also pushed me in the right direction and ultimately connected me with Cormorant Books and Mark Cote and Mark, you know, his insights into the book just really helped me realize the aspirations that I had for, for The Lost Expert. So Mark, and you know, I don't even have the words to thank you for what you've done for this book and Sally and Chantel and everyone at Cormorant, they're just like a great publisher and they really make you feel like you're, you're with a family uh so hopefully i didn't forget everyone anyone 
I'm going to finally hand things back to Alex. Uh, I hope that wasn't too long. Thank you. But, you know, <laughs> you go you go for a long time. You got to uh, thank everyone uh, and really everybody who joined me tonight. Uh, shout out to McShane, the king of the chat. Uh, <laughs> one of my hockey uh, team buddies. Uh, just, uh, you know, thanks. Thanks for being here. And over to Alex. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Hal and Valadin. That was a fantastic conversation. And I know I'm not the only person who's even more eagerly waiting the books to arrive in stores so that we can all read it. Um, so you can pick up um, a signed copy at Queen Books, or if you'd like to email us, we can also deliver uh, citywide. Um, so that's if you go to our website at queenbooks.ca, all of that, um, and shoot us an email from there and we will help you uh, get that done and congratulations Hal. Um, it's a huge accomplishment to publish one book let alone 11 and, and I hope there's many more. Um, thank you Mark and everyone at Cormorant Books and Chantel for setting it all up and thank you everyone for joining us and please just buy lots of books from any bookstore it doesn't have to be mine. <laughs> Thanks everyone.